Today we're going to begin Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And in verse 10, the Apostle Paul is writing to the great church of Ephesus. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, if you were not here in the Sunday evening service, I want to encourage you to order that tape because Sunday night we completely dealt with verse 10. Let's read it again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And as I pointed out on Sunday night, he didn't say put on some of the armor of God, but he said put on the whole armor of God. And this phrase, whole armor of God in Greek, is the word panoplia. It describes a Roman soldier that is completely outfitted in his armor. Every Roman soldier wore seven pieces of armor, and I want you to write these down. One of them appears to be missing in chapter 6. However, it is not missing. It's there. It's just a little disguised. The first piece of armor which the Roman soldier wore was his loin belt, his loin belt. And though it may at first be hard to understand, the loin belt was the most important piece of weaponry which the Roman soldier possessed. We'll be dealing more about this just a little bit later. The loin belt, the most important piece of weaponry which the Roman soldier possessed. Secondly, the Roman soldier had his shoes. Ephesians chapter 6 refers to these as shoes of peace. That when you understand what these shoes looked like, they were not very peaceful at all. These were killer shoes. They had spikes on the bottom of the shoes, which were two to three inches long. They had spikes on the front, spikes on the back. The spikes were called hobnails. These were killer shoes. The idea was, if you know how to use your shoes correctly, you will have a lot of peace in your life. And this is why the Bible refers to these as shoes of peace. Then there was the breastplate. The breastplate was the heaviest of all of these pieces of weaponry. Not only did it cover the front, it also covered the back. It was actually a piece of weaponry which covered the, in, the upper torso of the body. There were moments when the breastplate weighed up to 75 pounds. It was a very heavy piece of weaponry. The Bible tells us that the breastplate of Goliath weighed 125 pounds, 125 pounds. The spearhead alone on the spear of Goliath weighed more than 15 pounds. Not the spear, just the spearhead. So these are very heavy pieces of weaponry. In addition to the breastplate, there was the sword. There were several different kinds of swords. We'll be dealing with this later. But this was a sword which you didn't swing, but you used this store, sword in a stabbing action. It was very close combat, very close combat. And you would use it to stab your opponent. Then there was the helmet. The helmet was an amazing piece of weaponry, very decorative. It was the most noticeable of all the pieces of weaponry. Interesting because the Bible calls it the helmet of salvation. Our salvation is the most notable thing which God has done in our life. When you meet a person that is saved, you know that they're saved. Likewise, when you met a Roman soldier who had on his helmet, you couldn't help but notice his helmet because it was so decorative. And we'll be getting into this just a little bit later. Then there was the shield. Now, in Greek, there are two different words for a shield. The first word is the word aspis, spelled A-S-P-I-S. -S, and this word aspis describes what most of us think of when we think of a shield, a round shield, usually highly decorated. But this is not a shield which you would use in war because it didn't cover your body. Rather, this was a shield that you would carry in a parade or in some kind of public exhibition. That is not the word that is used here. The shield that is described in Ephesians chapter 6 is from the Greek word thurion. And if you're write, writing down notes, that's T-H-U-R-E-O-N, T-H-U-R-E-O-N, from the Greek word thurios. And the word thurios is the Greek word for a door, a door, an oblong door. This tells us the dimensions of this shield. 
It was not a small decorative round shield, but rather it was the size of a door. It was tall, it was wide, which means it covered you from the top to the bottom and from the side to the other side. This was the shield. Interesting that when you came into the Roman infantry, one of the first things they would do is take your measurements. And once they had your measurements, then they would begin to devise your individual particular shield so that you were covered from the top to the bottom, from one side to the other side. It was a measurement of faith or a shield given just to cover you. Now, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, if I just had as much faith as brother so-and-so, or if I just had as much faith as this sister, but we're told in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 that God has given to every man the measure of faith, which means you don't need to worry about how much faith other people have. When you were born again and came into the infantry of God's army, God measured you, and God gave you enough faith to make sure you are covered from head to toe and from side to side. You have all the faith that you need. Then there was the, sh the uh, spear. Now, I call the spear our spear of influence. Our spear of influence. Now, you don't find the spear real clearly in this chapter, but when you come down to verse 18, you do find that it's there. It has to be here. It has to be here. Because this chapter says in verse 11, we are to put on the whole armor of God. Not part of the armor, but the whole armor of God. The Greek word panoplia. And so the spear has to be in this text. And I call the spear our spear of influence. Now, there were several kinds of spears. But if you were well trained with a spear, you were able to hurl that spear from great, great distances. And the purpose of your spear was to devastate your enemy before he got too close. And you find this in verse 18 when the Apostle Paul writes, praying always with all kinds of prayer and intercession. Prayer and intercession is what I call doing business with the enemy long distance. It's dealing him a devastating blow before he gets too close. Now, all of these are the pieces of weaponry which are given to us when we become born again and when we receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now, positionally, these belong to every believer. Every believer who calls upon the name of Jesus has a covenant right to these weapons. But when you come to chapter 6 and verse 11, the very first two key words tells us when these pieces of warfare become activated in our life. He says, put on. And as we've seen before, these two words, put on, is the Greek word in duo, in duo. The same word which we find in Luke 24, verse 49, where Jesus refers to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He says to the disciples, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now that word in duo is used in this text. And when he says, put on the whole armor of God, there is a strong implication in the Greek that these gifts are not activated in our life until the power of God comes upon us. And when that power comes upon us, it begins to manifest and dress us in the whole armor of God. And when we are dressed in the whole armor of God, verse 11 says, we are able to stand against, everybody say against, this word against is the Greek word anti. The word stand is the Greek word stani. The word stani means to stand. When you compound it together with the word against, it's a man that is leaning into something. He's not just holding his territory, but he is in a forward position. He's pushing against. He's not being pursued, but now rather he is the one that is the pursuer. He is standing against. Against what? The wiles, the wiles of the devil. 
circle this word wiles. What are the wiles of the devil? You know, when I was a little kid, growing up in the Baptist church, our family was very involved in church. Every time the doors were open, the Renner family was a church. Our doors at home were just like a revolving door, people coming in, people going out, and every Sunday night after church, my parents would have a whole big group of adults over to our house, and they would enjoy each other and have fellowship, and while they were in the living room enjoying each other, all of us little Baptist kids <laughs> would crawl up on the bed in the back room, and while our parents were not watching, we would turn on the television. And every Sunday night at 10 o'clock, there was a program called Fantastic Theater. And Fantastic Theater showed horror movies every Sunday night. <laughs> every Sunday night. And all of us Baptist kids, we'd load up in the bed, pull the covers over our heads, pull them down to peak as we would watch the most horrific movies like the blob. <laughs> now, you know, those don't sound too horrific today, but back in those days, those were scary movies. Did anybody ever hear see the movie called The Thing? That movie, The Thing, haunted me for years. It was about a woman that lost her hand, and the hand was alive, and that hand would crawl. And I remember one scene where that hand crawled up the pleats of the bedspread and dragged itself across the bed to the sleeping woman and locked itself around her throat and strangled her to death. It was this hand without a body. That image lived so strong in my mind that I thought about it all the time. When I went to bed at night, I would tuck the bedspread in around the bottom of the mattress so the thing would not come while I was sleeping. Every Sunday night in church, we had a baptismal service. And during the baptismal service, they would turn off all the lights. Well, I have a very vivid imagination and always have. And when they would turn off the lights, that movie would begin to replay in my mind. And I would sit in my chair and put my feet on the pew in front of me so the thing wouldn't crawl up my leg during the baptismal service. And when the baptismal service was over, they wouldn't find Rick Renner dead from the hand that strangled him. I always thought there was somebody in the closet, something under the bed. The wiles of the devil. What is that? Is it some spook that's around the corner that's waiting to get you? What is the wiles of the devil? Everybody say, the wiles of the devil. Well, I'll tell you what we really have here. We have a revelation from the Spirit of God to let us know how the devil operates. He does not operate with spooks in the closet or some shadow under the bed. But this word wiles tells us almost scientifically exactly how the devil assaults us. And I want you to take a note of this, and today I'm going to give you what I call six words of spiritual warfare. Six words of spiritual warfare. And the first two words we find in this verse. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Take a note of this word wiles. This word wiles comes from the Greek word methodias, methodias. Now you probably hear another word in that. What word do you hear? You hear the word methods. Sometimes this is translated as the word strategy, but it carries the idea of a logical attack. 
a logical attack. However, the word methodios, taken from two Greek, com from two Greek words and compounded together, the first word is the word meta, M-E-T-A, and this word meta means with, with, W-I-T-H. The second word is the word odas, and this word odas is the Greek word for a road, a road. It's where we get the term for the odometer in your car. That comes from the Greek word odas. It means a road. And when you compound these two words together, it forms the word methodias. And this word methodias, here translated wiles, describes, and I want you to write this down, one who operates on a single lane of travel. One who operates on a single lane of travel. Or one who travels with one road or with one direction. With one road or with one direction. You say, Brother Rick, why is this important? Because it tells us the devil does not have numerous tricks in his bag. Every time the devil attacks an individual, he does it the very same way. He has one weapon. He has one method of assault. He has one road that he travels on. And every time the devil operates and attacks, he does it the very same way. Now, the reason this is important is because if you can figure out the way that he attacks, then you can stop the attacks in your life. But now, how many of you know that roads go somewhere? Roads go somewhere. So if the devil is journeying on one road, if he has one method, one lane of attack, where is the devil headed? This leads us to the next word. Also in this verse, the word devil. The second word having to do with spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now take a note of this word devil. The Greek word for devil is the Greek word diabolos. Diabolos. Also a compound of two words. The word dia and the word balos. The word dia, D-I-A, please write this down, D-I-A, carries the idea of total penetration. Total penetration. To penetrate a thing from one side all the way through to the other side. The Greek word dia. The second part of the name devil comes from the word balos. And this word balos means to throw something, like to throw a ball or to throw a rock. However, when you compound it together with the word dia and it becomes the name devil, the Greek word diabolos, it's the picture of one who strikes repeatedly again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and again striking and striking and striking and striking until finally, Dia, he has penetrated from one side all the way through to the other side. Now we come to the third word of spiritual warfare, the word devices. We find this word in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, where the Apostle Paul says, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. This word devices is the Greek word noemata. If you're taking notes, N-O-E-M-A-T-A. N-O-E-M-A-T-A, the Greek word noemata. It comes from the word nous. The word nous is the Greek word for the mind. The mind. But when the word nous becomes noemata, which in 2 Corinthians 2.11 is translated devices, it describes a mind. Yes, it's a mind. But now the mind is no longer noose. Now the mind is noemata. It is a mind that is confused. It's a brain that has been scrambled. And so now we find, number one, the word wiles. The devil operates on one single lane of attack. Every time the devil attacks, he attacks the very same way. Number two, the word devil. We know that wherever the devil is headed, his intention is to strike and strike and strike and strike and strike repeatedly until dia. He penetrates that object from one side 
all the way through to the other side. Now we come to the third word, the word devices, the Greek word noemata, which tells us where the devil is headed and what he is striking. He comes to strike the mind, and his intention is to penetrate the mind and the emotions and to so thoroughly penetrate it until he would scramble those brains and fill that mind with confusion. Noemata. I translate this mind games. Mind games. Then you come to the fourth word of spiritual warfare. You find this word all over the New Testament. It is the Greek word doleos. The word doleos is normally translated deception. Deception. But this word doleos is a fishing term. A fishing term. It means to tempt that fish. To draw that fish out and get that fish to bite that bait. And once that fish wraps its mouth around that bait, jerk back and set the hook. The Greek word doleos, normally translated deception in the New Testament. Now, I grew up in a bass boat because my father loved to fish. And we would go out on that river or we would go out onto that lake for hours at a time. And my father was so good with a lure. It was almost like he learned how to think like a fish. And I would watch my father as he would cast that lure out. And he was so professional in the way he did it. He could land that lure right between the little crevice of two rocks, so close that there's no way a fish could be back up in there. (laughs) But it would plop in the water. And then my dad would begin to reel in and he would jerk that lure to make that lure look like it was alive. Now I could just see the fish who knew it was a lure and knew that there was a hook in it. But that fish, though he knows it's dangerous, follows that lure. And every time you jerk that lure and make it look alive, that fish focuses on that lure and comes closer. And then you reel and jerk, and the fish suddenly forgets that there's a hook, and he comes closer and closer and closer and closer until finally, wham, he bites that lure. And you set the hook. That's where the word deception comes from. Which tells us in some way, Satan dangles something in front of our eyes or in front of our emotions. And though we may know that it is wrong, because we permit ourselves to look and to think about it, He begins to draw us out until we lose the sense of danger, almost become hypnotized by that thing and bite that thing. And then Satan sets the hook. So you have the word deception. Now we have four words. Number one, wiles. Number two, devil. Number three, devices. Number four, the word deception. Number five, The word stronghold, stronghold. We find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, where the Bible tells us that our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I want you to take a note. This word strongholds described two things, two things. Number one, it described a mightily defended fortress, a mightily defended fortress like a castle, like the castles that we see all over Europe or all over Russia, these mighty, mighty castles. And if you've ever been to an old fortress, you know that the walls of these fortresses are very tall and the walls are very thick. They are designed so no one can come over the top and no one can break in through the side. Secondly, this word stronghold 
was used most often to describe a prison. A prison. A prison is just the opposite of a fortress. A fortress is designed to keep people out. A prison is designed to keep people in which tells us when you have a stronghold operating in your life, you are in a spiritual and emotional prison. You are behind bars. Though you want to get out and you can see freedom, there is something which keeps you locked up. And because you have a stronghold which has captivated your mind and your belief system, it also keeps the people who could help you from coming over the top or breaking through the side to bring you deliverance. How many of you have ever spoken to a person that has a stronghold in their life? You speak the Word of God to them, and it's so clear. The solution is so visible to you, but they can't see it. It's like you can't break through to them. You can logically explain it to them. You can show them from the Bible. You can pull out your calculator and show them according to the numbers that this thing is going to work out. There's no reason for you to have this fear, but they are in a stronghold, and they can't hear you. There's something that is keeping you outside. Then last... Number six, the sixth word of spiritual warfare, the word oppression. Oppression. The word oppression is found in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, where the Bible says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Can you say amen to that? (laughs) With a Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were what? oppressed of the devil. Now take a note of this word oppression. This is the sixth word of spiritual warfare. This word oppression, please write this down, is the old Greek word which describes a tyrant, a tyrant, or a wicked king. A tyrant or a wicked king. Now my wife and I live in the former Soviet Union, where communism, like a tyrant, ruled millions upon millions of people. Communist leaders told people what they would think, where they would live, what would be the outcome of their lives. Communism stripped them of their individuality. It stole from them their joy and turned people into slaves of the state. And the people simply submitted to it as the communists dominated like a tyrant and ruled the entire nation. This word oppression describes that kind of ruler, a wicked king, one who forcibly imposes his will upon his subjects, whether they like it or not. He tells them what they'll make, what they'll eat, what they'll live. He tells them what will be the outcome of their life and what will not be the outcome of their life. As a wicked tyrant, he rules. One man has even translated this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were being tyrannized by the devil. So now you have these six words of warfare. Number one, the word wiles, the Greek word methodias one who travels with a road. Number two, the name devil. By the way, take a note of this. The name devil is not just a proper name. It is actually a job description. It tells us the devil's mode of operation. When the devil comes to attack, he doesn't just attack you once. You see, if the devil tried to sink a lie into your brain one time, you would be wise enough to recognize this was an assault of the enemy. So instead, the devil comes again and again and again and again and again. He tells it to you once. He tells it to you again. Then he inspires other people to begin to repeat it to you until now you're hearing it from all sides and your mind begins to entertain the thought which leads to deception that you bite the bait. And when you bite the bait, the mind games begin to take place. Now, 
There are two voices speaking to you all the time. Two voices speaking to you all the time. The Word of God, the voice of God, speaking to you, telling you who you are in Jesus Christ, telling you what you can do through the power of the Holy Ghost. But then there is a second voice. And the second voice is the voice of the enemy which may come to your mind directly or it may come to you indirectly through your friends, through your neighbors, through your family, through the world around you. It's telling you who you are not in Jesus Christ, what you cannot do, and which voice you listen to and which voice you believe determines what is going to manifest in your life. Faith works in both directions. Faith works in both directions. If you release your faith in the Word of God, your faith will empower that truth to become a reality in your life. But if you listen to the word of the enemy and then begin to repeat what the enemy says, with your faith you will energize and empower that lie so that it becomes who you are. You know, as faith people, we love Mark 11, 23. Jesus said, have the faith of God. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Did you know that the devil can use that verse too? If the devil can get you to see something and to believe it. And if he can get you to line your mouth up with that lie that he's placing in your head. This same principle which works on the positive side will also work on the negative side. If he can get you to believe it and to say it so that your mind and your mouth are sane and agreeing with this lie, you can cause that lie to come to pass in your life. I don't know about you, but I think this is pretty powerful teaching. What we think about and what we say is very important. Now, I want everybody to say, my mind is the control center of my life. Say it again. My mind is the control center of my life. Somebody said, no, 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 no. My spirit is my control center. Well, your spirit ought to be your control center. But the truth is, your mind stands between your body and your spirit. And it's with your mind that you decide which part of you is going to dominate. You have to choose to walk in the Spirit or you have to choose to walk in the flesh. So your mind is the central control center of your life. And the devil knows. If he can get your mind, he has your life. If he can control your mind, he can control your emotions. And whoever controls your emotions can work you like a puppet. They can control your self-image. They can control your relationships. Your mind is the central control center of your life. This is why everybody wants your mind. The world wants your mind. The world wants the mind of your children. Communist governments wants the mind and the thinking of the people. That's why they fill them with propaganda. The devil wants your mind. God wants your mind. This is why we're told to renew our minds with the Word of God because a mind that is dominated by the truth is a mind that will liberate a spirit. And the devil understands this. Now, the devil's been working with people for 6,000 years. He knows who we are. He knows how we operate. He doesn't have to invent a brand new method of attack for every person. He knows basically every single person can be brought down 
the very same way. And therefore, he has one major trick in his bag. He travels on one road. He is headed directly to the brain. His intention is diabolos, the word devil, to penetrate, to beat that brain and beat that brain until finally he penetrates, begins to scramble up your brain, cause you to have mind games, then gets you to bite the bait so he can set the hook, and he then can begin to build a stronghold and from that stronghold in your brain then he can begin to dictate to you like a wicked king or an evil tyrant now let me give you an illustration from my personal life when i was growing up as i've already told you i watched horror movies and my parents even let me watch them i used to watch dark shadows how do you remember old dark shadows Barnabas Collins, Judith, Angelique. I was like hypnotized by all those dark programs. Frankenstein, vampires, dark shadows. Do you know why I believe I was hypnotized by that? Because it was supernatural. You see, if you don't find supernatural in the church, you will turn to find supernatural somewhere else. And there was something in me that was hungry for the supernatural. And this was power from another realm. And so I longed to see those kind of programs. Well, of course, those were all black and white programs, and they were more stupid than they were scary. Well, when I became a university student, I hadn't seen a horror movie in years, in years. Now, I remembered all those movies because visual images stay with you for the rest of your life. Well, some of my friends from church came to see me, and they said, Brother Rick, they said, all the movie theaters in town this week are going to show horror movies. And tonight, five of us guys from the church, we're going to go to these horror movies. In fact, we're going to go every night this week. It's spring break. We're just going to have fun and go see a bunch of dumb horror movies. Brother Rick, you want to go with us? I thought, well, I haven't seen a horror movie in years. This will be a lot of fun. Well, I didn't realize how horror movies had changed from the time that I was a child. And they're worse today than they were 20 years ago. And so I hopped in the car, and we rode on out to the drive-in theater. Me and my spirit-filled buddies from church. <laughs> to start a week of horror movies. And as I sat in my seat and watched these movies... It was so horrific. They were no longer black and white. The blood looked like blood. These were vivid. They were terrifically scary. Heads rolling down the stairs. Killers lying under beds, waiting for the victim to come to bed so he could ram the knife up to the bottom of the bed and kill them from underneath. By the end of that first night, I had seen three of those horror movies. I went home that night not wanting to tell my friends, but I was emotionally devastated. I wanted to be a man, so I didn't want to tell them that I was bothered. They were laughing, but inside I was totally torn up. Those images were so bad. Came home that night, reached over to turn off my lamp, and decided not to turn it off that night. <laughs> Slept with the lights on that whole night. Every time I heard a sound outside the window, I was sitting straight up in my bed because those movies were rolling around inside my soul. You know, your mind is like a movie screen. Well, the next day, just about the time that I had gotten over all of those horrible images... The phone rang, and it was those guys. They said, Rick, we're leaving in 15 minutes. We'll be by to pick you up. I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to go tonight. And they said, ah, are you scared? And I said, I'll be ready in 15 minutes. <laughs> by the end of that week, they had conned me into seeing 15 horror movies.
Every time I shut my eyes at night, I saw blood, guts, totally normal people who lost their mind and killed everybody in the family. And the devil began to speak to me and said, that's what's going to happen to you. You are one of those normal people. You're going to lose your mind, and you're going to kill the people that you love. I'd bind that, and wham, he'd come back to strike me again. Striking and striking and striking and striking. I would lay in bed all night binding the devil. Unfortunately, I was binding what I allowed him to put into my brain. Well, several years passed. Denise and I got married, and we were pastoring a church in the state of Arkansas. And one night, we were having a Bible study in our home, and a man came into our house that was part of a motorcycle gang called the Diablos. And when he came into our house, he had all kinds of leather, and he had screwdrivers and knives and all kinds of things hanging from his clothes, and he had spikes on his hat and stunk and just looked horrible and was unshaven. And he looked like somebody that could do real damage. And he sat in our home and began to cry and said that he wanted to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he wept and he cried and he prayed the prayer and said all the right words, but something in me knew. This man's a con artist. Well, he began attending the big Baptist church where we were at that time, and he began to tell his testimony about how his life had been changed in the renter's living room. The pastor stood in the pulpit and said, this may be one of the greatest conversions since Saul of Tarsus. And because the pastor put all his weight behind it, the whole church rallied behind this man. Doctors bought him a car, gave him an apartment, bought him clothes. They wanted to give him money to live on while he began to grow in the Lord. And something in me knew this man was a con artist. Well, since I was trained as a journalist, that's what I studied in college, I let that journalist in me go to work, and I began to do some investigative research. And I found out this man had just been saved in five other great big Baptist churches where he had been given a car and an apartment and money to live on and clothes. And now he was in our church. And so I informed the pastor what I had discovered, and the pastor made a public statement from the pulpit, provide no more care for this man. This man is a fraud. Well, the one part of his story that was true was that he was a member of the motorcycle gang called the Diablos, who at that time in the state of Arkansas were on trial and were being sought for vicious murders, which they had just committed. That part of his story was true. And so one day the telephone rang, and it was him. He said, Rick, you have messed with the wrong man. When you touched me, you touched the Diablos. He hung the phone up. <laughs> and 15 horror movies begin to be replayed in my mind. When was it going to happen? When would they find us? What time of the day or night would it be? Denise and I lived in a very old home that was provided for us by the Baptist church back in those days. It was so old, the windows of the house would not lock. And because the local police believed that our life was in danger, they moved us into another church property. However, the Diablos, with all of their motorcycles, began to circle our house every night. I said, Denise, they're going to kill us. So man of faith that I am, I bought a Doberman Pinscher. <laughs> the kindest, sweetest dog we've ever owned in our life. 
One night, the Diablos came to our house, banged on the door, and the dog, whose name was Jerome, <laughs> sat at the front door and wagged its tail because company had finally come. This dog was no help to us at all. And I would lay in bed at night, and I would think, they're going to come through the windows. You see the devil beating my mind, beating my mind. I would get up, check all the locks on all the windows. I would check all the doors, come back, get back in bed, lay in bed for five minutes and say, Denise, did I really check the windows and the doors or did I just imagine? Was that last night or did I really just do it? She said, honey, you just did it for the third time tonight. Denise, I don't think so. I think that maybe we fell asleep and just dreamed that I did it. I'd get up and do it again. I was tormented because of the images that were in my mind. Finally, this man put a pipe bomb in a woman's car. This is how dangerous he was. It was so explosive and so hot, it melted the dash in her car. He had aimed to kill her. Well, finally, this passed. Then we began pastoring our own church. And a woman came to see me who said, Brother Rick, I want to talk to you about my marriage. I said, all right. She said, Brother Rick, do you remember last year when my husband stabbed me? I said, yes, I think I remember that. <laughs> she said, well, you know, I really loved my husband. And she said, I know he put a butcher knife in my back. But she said, I loved him, so I just went to the hospital, and I never pressed charges, and we've been living together all this time. But this morning, my husband told me that when he came home tonight, he was going to blow my head off and leave my brains all over the walls of our house. She said, I just need some pastoral advice. What do you think I should do? I said, well, considering that he did stab you last year, I think that I would take his threat seriously. And if I were you, I wouldn't go home tonight. And that's all I said. I walked her out of my office. She said, do you mind if I use your telephone? I said, sure, please. She picked up the phone, dialed the number. She was dialing her husband. And she said, hello. I just saw Rick Renner. He told me to divorce you and never let you see our children again. Click. I said, I did not say that. Why did you tell him that I said that? I'm just so sorry, Brother Rick. I just kind of got out of control, and I thought to myself, I know why that man wants to kill her. <laughs> well, she walked out the office, and the telephone rang. And it was the husband. I tried to explain that I did not say that. He said, quit lying to me. He said, the gun that I was going to use on my wife, I'm going to use on you, on your wife. At that time, we only had one son and your son. He said, let me tell you how I'm going to kill your wife, and then let me tell you what I'm going to do with your son. Well, this man began calling and calling and calling and calling. It was like terror. Well, you know, the first 200 calls you can handle. <laughs> but there were so many calls coming that we bought a special device so we could begin to record the telephone calls. And I'm going to tell you how many called. It's not the real number, but Denise told me not to exaggerate. So I'm going to give you a realistic number, 2,000 times. Every day, we would answer, hang up, answer, hang up, answer, hang up, answer, hang up. We filled 20 90-minute cassettes with his telephone calls. I would lay in bed at night. We would hear the brushing, the wind blowing a bush outside the window, and I'd say, Denise, it's him. I know that it's him. I'd get up. I would want to look 
out the window, but I was afraid that if I looked out the window, I'd see a gun. And so I was afraid to even look out the window. The phone would ring in the middle of the night. And I would lay in bed debating, do I want to answer it? What if it's him? One time, five times, ring, 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 25 times, 35 times. I would say, Denise, should I answer it? What if it's him? Honey, I'm afraid to answer it. What if it's him? But what if it's a church member that's in trouble? They're committing suicide. I'll feel guilty forever if I didn't answer the phone. Finally, pick up the phone. Hello, preacher. Something bothering you tonight. Took you a while to answer the phone. I was by your house today. Did you know there's a window unlocked? See you in a minute. Click. Fifteen horror movies would begin to roll around inside my brain. This was a very serious situation. The man was crazy. He ended up being dealt with by the district attorney because in one of those calls I said, if you call me again, I'm going to contact the district attorney. He said, you tell the district attorney, I'm going to cut his head off of his shoulders. So I went down to see the district attorney. <laughs> well, I did not know that threatening a public official was a felony. I didn't know that. So I just took a sack full of 20 cassette tapes, set them on his desk, and said, this man is threatening to kill me. He said, Mr. Renner, there's not much we can do until he actually attempts to kill you. He said, he has to touch you, he has to do something, then we can take action. He said, I don't have time for this and there's nothing I can do. Well, I just turned the sack upside down and poured all 20 tapes on his desk. And said, my taxes help pay your salary, and I'm not leaving until you listen to one of these tapes. By coincidence, <laughs> he reached in, pulled out a tape, put it in his player, hit play, and it said, tell the district attorney I'm going to cut his head off of his shoulders. And suddenly it wasn't my problem anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know, when you have all the Looney Tunes in the state trying to kill you, you begin to wonder what, what is wrong with you? And I begin to pray and seek the Lord, Lord, what is this? Why are all these people trying to kill me, these maniacs with guns and knives? And then there was the Catholic woman who also wanted to kill me <laughs> because her son had been saved in our Baptist church and she was very serious. And by the way, one of these people, I called their psychiatrist and said, listen, this person is threatening to kill me. Uh, tell me what you think about this. And that psychiatrist said to me, preacher, if I was you, I would get out of town. This person is going to kill you and your family. These attacks went on for three years. Three years of this constant terror from one, then the next one, then the next one. All right, are you with me? I said, Lord, what is this? What opened the door for all of these attacks to come into my life? And you know, if you'll ask the Lord, he will answer that question. And suddenly, it was like I was transported back in time. And I saw myself as that little Baptist boy sitting with my little sister, Lori, in the bedroom of our house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And on the table between me and my sister was a Ouija board. Well, when I was a child and we Baptist kids were watching all the horror movies, 
Every Sunday night when we went to training union, we also took our Ouija boards because we didn't even really believe in the devil. We thought people who believed in the devil were kind of crazy. And so we thought the Ouija board was just another game. We took it to church on Sunday night. And while our kids were preparing to, our parents were preparing to teach Sunday school the next week, we were upstairs, supposed to be having training union. Instead, we were back in the back room playing with Ouija boards. Well, my sister had a Ouija board. And I remembered when the Holy Spirit took me back, I remembered crawling up into the top of the closet and pulling out her treasured Ouija board and laying it on the table in between me and my little sister. And I said to Lori, Lori, we're going to ask this thing when we're going to die. And we put our fingers on that little amulet. And without any movement from our hands, that amulet began to slip across that board. And it slipped over to the number two. And then it began to move over to the number seven. And the Holy Spirit taking me back, refreshing my memory about that event, I could hear myself saying to my little sister, the spirits are speaking to us. And they're telling us that I'm going to die when I'm 27. Lori, I'm going to die an unnatural death by the time that I'm 27. And when the Lord showed me this, I realized that at an early age in my life, I had made it easy for the devil. I had opened a door. And my entire younger life, I had had a fascination or a premonition that I was going to die early. I wondered, why did I have this premonition? Why did it bother me? Why did I think this? Now I understood it went back to that seed that was sown into my soul when I was a little boy. That seed and all of those images empowered the enemy to strike my mind. And now my faith, listening to those things, fearing them, terrorized by it, the devil trying to get me to believe that somebody really was going to kill me, his intention was to kill me by the time that I was 27. But when I was 27 is when these attacks stopped in my life because I repented for watching the movies and repented for the Ouija board. Do you know what repentance is? Don't be offended by what I'm going to say. But when you really repent, it's like the Holy Ghost gives you a supernatural abortion. Now, abortion in the natural is wrong. But when something has been sown into your soul that is evil, you need it to be removed. Turn over to James chapter 1. I want you to see something. James chapter 1. Are you enjoying this? Look at James chapter 1. Verse 14. James 1, verse 14. But every man, everybody say every man. That means that this applies to everybody the same way. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Drawn away and enticed is this bait term, this fishing term. It's the picture of plopping something tempting in front of your eyes. Temptation does not have to be a sexual sin. It could just be a thought to think something wrong, to believe something wrong. And now the devil begins to dangle that in front of your eyes, trying to entice you and draw you out. Now look at this. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James gives us two illustrations in these verses. In verse 14, he uses a fishing illustration. Now listen carefully. Every man is tempted or seduced 
when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's dropping the lure in front of your face, jerking that thing, trying to make it feel alive so that you'll focus on it. And here's what happens. Like a fish, we get closer and closer and closer to that lie. Finally, we get so close mentally and emotionally that verse 15 says, we conceive. This word conceive is the Greek word which refers to the act of intimacy. Well, how does a woman conceive a baby? Do you conceive a baby by sitting in a chair across the room from your husband? No. In order for you to conceive, you've got to become very, very close. And so now we find that this precious believer has become so close to this thing in his mind and his emotions until finally it conceives. What does it say next? It says, when sin has conceived, lust hath conceived, it brings forth death. And death when it is finished, or death when it is fully grown, ready to give birth, brings forth what? Death. And verse 16 says, do not err, my beloved brethren. In other words, now that I've told you how this works, don't allow this to happen in your life. But now what if it's too late? What if you've already conceived a temptation in your soul? The devil's striking and striking your mind to commit adultery. Or the devil's striking in your mind to steal. Or perhaps the devil's striking your mind with the lie that you're of no worth, that you have no self-image, telling you that you're lower than the lowest worm. And he struck you and struck you and struck you and struck you and you believed in it. And sometimes the devil will use those around you to speak to you. Sometimes parents innocently have spoken like the voice of the devil to their kids. You're good for nothing. You'll never be anything. You're good for nothing. The words of a parent carry authority. And when a parent says to a child, you're good for nothing, you might as well just join hands with the devil because you're helping him completely mar the self-image of that child. And he will grow up believing he's good for nothing. And when he tries to become something in life, he'll have to try to deal with and overcome the voice of his parents speaking in his mind. You're good for nothing. You'll never amount to anything. The devil's striking and striking. And do you know some of the most talented people, the most brilliant people in the whole world no one knows about and no one ever will because they conceived a lie in their mind that has produced in them a self-image so low that it has buried their talents and their gifts. What they conceived brought forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. But what if you've already erred? What if you've already conceived? You need to repent. And you, you repent, the Holy Ghost stretch his divine arm right into the realm of your soul, and he grabs that thing that is developing and forming, and he jerks that thing out. And now with his power, you can begin to renew your mind so that once again, you're back in that position where you ought to be. Can you say amen to that? Now, everything you heard today started with the word wiles. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the wiles of the devil. Write down something else, and we're about to close for today. The words war and warfare. War and warfare are used five times in the New Testament. Five times in the New Testament. 
every time they are used. They are used in connection with the mind. They're used in connection with the mind. Which tells us the primary arena of spiritual warfare is not in the heavenlies. It's not in a cosmic realm, but it's in your mind. He knows if he can get your mind, the battle's finished. Now, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Everybody say high places. Now, because of these two words, high places, some people have developed whole doctrines of cosmic warfare, warfare that happens out in the heavenlies. Well, certainly we know that there are principalities and powers in the heavenlies. And that's where some angelic warfare takes place. You can find that in Daniel chapter 10. But the warfare that we need to be concerned about is not the warfare that happens in the heavenlies. It's the warfare that happens down here. This phrase, high places, in Greek describes the atmosphere. The atmosphere. Now, there were two words that could be used here. One describes the air above the mountains, the air above the mountains, and actually that's where angelic warfare takes place. The second word describes the air below the mountains, the air below the mountains. This word describes the air that we breathe, the environment where we live, and that is the word which is used here which is very unfortunate that it was translated high places because it really carries the idea of the lower places. It's the lower, denser regions of the air. And if you study what the early church fathers wrote, the early church fathers wrote in confirmation of this that the lower regions of the air were densely populated with unclean spirits that come to affect the way people think. That was written by the early church fathers. You say, well, what are the high places? How high do you have to go to deal with the devil? About as high as your head. Six feet, five feet, four feet. That's about as high as you need to be concerned about. The angels will take care of everything above your head. If you can get a grip on your head, your warfare is probably finished. If you don't get a grip on your head, you are in trouble. Because that's where he's coming to assault you. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. If you would like to receive more information about Rick Renner Ministries, please visit us at renner.org. Start your day on the path towards success and peace as you discover something new from God's Word with Rick Renner's outstanding devotional, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. You may purchase a copy of Sparkling Gems on our website or check us out on iTunes. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. With your support, we will continue to teach, strengthen, and rescue lives in need. Together, we can make a difference.